Okay. And what we're going to do is we're going to go over um, some of the asana that we covered in um, in Monica's photo shoot the other day. And so that photo shoot was surrounded by this book, Yoga Anatomy, Leslie Kamenoff, Guru of All Things Yoga, assisted by Amy Matthews, Awesome Yogi. And so uh, for those of you that don't know, uh, the pictures in this book, like that's actually Amy Matthews in there. Um, and Leslie Kamenoff's in here and another guy, his name's Jay, is in here too. And so the process of this was um, they have people come in and do these asana, and then they had an artist render what the primary movers would be and what the anatomy would be. And then that would then bud into this book that we all love and adore. <clears throat> So for those of you that are not familiar with this book, I recommend you get a copy. Uh, there's two different versions. There's the first edition, which is the one I'm going off today. And then there's the second edition, which is far more elaborate. And it's not that one is better than the other. They're just from different points of view. And so the first edition is um, more direct. Like it, it goes through a picture of the posture with the muscles that are being used. You know, <clears throat> this would be an example of what that looked like. Uh, it goes over you know, the classification and level, the key structures, which is like what, what muscles are being used, the joint actions, how they're being used, uh, the working, like what's engaged, what's in working, what's, what's part of it, maybe not the primary mover, but what's part of it, maybe assisting, uh, what's, what's lengthening. And they actually, here's a fun fact, is they switched up the word stretch, took it out and added in lengthening. And there's this, this whole thing that's a, a whole other different lesson. But um, I picked that up when I was studying with Leslie Kamenoff over the summer. And I still attend his monthly live Zoom. So if you haven't had a chance to check that out, definitely uh, feel free to hit me up a message in the comments and I will direct you on where to go so you can be part of that. And I'll see you on the Zoom with Leslie Kamenoff each month. It's just amazing uh, with this amazing supportive team at that. Um, okay, and then the breathing. So what is the integration of the pranayama, of the breath in any given posture? And, you know, just, just a caveat there, I would say that whatever you're doing with your asana in regards to your breath, Leslie Kamenoff will often recommend, just switch it up, you know, just don't get stuck in a breathing pattern would, would be the bigger goal. Uh, okay. And then uh, obstacles, right? Like what muscles might actually um, pose a problem and some notes, just random things like if her chair you know, it, it talks about the knees, vulnerability in the position and so on. Uh, so what I did, my project with Monica was we went through and we took photos of all of the assignments that's in this book. And don't tell anyone, it's like top secret. But um, since I've been playing around with the Adobe Suites, uh, I'm going to transform those photos into sketches and then create a coloring book for my yoga teacher trainees to use. I know it's exciting. I can't wait. Uh, so, okay. So with no further ado, let me just get into this here and it should be some fun for you. Uh, and then if you have questions or something, you can just drop it in the, um, in the comments below and I will definitely take care of that just my most soonest availability. Absolutely. Okay, so pulling up my photo shoot with Monica and she did such a beautiful job. Uh, I think you'll be really pleased to see to see the hard work that she put in. I was, I was really quite very proud of her. So more and then screen share, and then photos, and then share. Uh, get back here. Okay, uh, so this is Monica taking mountain pose. And, you know, essentially with mountain pose in this, in this particular book, they, they really, really break it down. They break it down as far as the position of the feet, uh, the weight distribution of the feet, uh, approach it as far as like what part of the feet are landing on the surface and uh, the, the three arches of the foot. Um, it goes over the different muscles in the feet and the bones of the feet. This is something that we would break out 
you know, in, into groups and such and, and unpack in yoga teacher training. But for the purpose of this, you know, the real, the real thing, the real key thing with this is we want to find a nice clean line between the insteps of the feet and up through the center of your body alongside the spine or along the spine and up through the crown chakra or top of the head. It's though we're like a marionette doll being held by a string. And so these are just a couple of things that you could possibly consider. Uh, you know, that mountain pose uh, is, is, it's just an easy standing pose, right, for some, but others would say you would need to spend your entire life working on mastering this pose. And I subscribe to that camp in that every asana that we know of, and I think there's about 80,000 of them out there, every asana that we know of is somehow you can find the mountain in that pose because our spine doesn't change, you know, we're jellyfish, right? And so, Essentially, if we if we bend our pulleys or levers, right, or if we stretch or if we straighten, whatever it is we do uh, with 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 our arms, our legs, our head, you know, that kind of thing, or the position we choose to put our spine in, ultimately, in the end, we want to consider how far away from mountain are we getting, in what direction away from mountain are we getting, and I would say why, you know, suggest why would we go about doing it. So finding the mountain every post is a really, really great way to get a handle on how to go about doing yoga. So if you are in your warrior one, for example, right? And so if you were teaching a yoga class and you had your students in warrior one and you invited them to step the right foot forward into warrior two, float the fingertips towards the sky, we might invite them to have the hips forward, right? Rather than open as we would see in a warrior two, for example. So at edge, we have a sequence where it's warrior one, warrior two, or in reverse warrior, which is warrior one, those hips are forward, warrior two, those hips are open, in reverse warrior, we send it back. And I really like that sequence because it really allows the instructor time to walk the practitioner through going through that open chain, closed chain thing. If you don't know what that means, is you know, where, where, our, where our hips are in relationship to warrior one versus where our hips are in relationship to warrior two and how we can move our bodies in a mindful way so that we're not just zipping through it for the sake of zipping through it. But, you know, yoga and mindfulness and presence, these, these ideas marry quite well. Uh, so if you go through your mountain pose and you consider, okay, before any other asana, I really want to get a handle on my mountain. And it might look different for you than the person standing next to you. And that's completely fine. So for some of us, we have a wider um, uh, pelvis. And so that might mean that the feet, such as Monica here, exhibited as together might be wider and there might be a space between it maybe like a softball size or something you know to, to give you a, a visual demonstration but ultimately where the distribution of the weight that's occurring at the soles of the feet underneath the feet and involving and including the arches of the feet that remains unchanged and so when when folks want to put their feet together when essentially maybe they just have a wider bony structure and it'd be more appropriate for them to come a little bit wider they might feel that they don't have the pose that they're not quite there you know something along like those lines and i really invite you to maybe take another glance at how that how what 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 shows up for you as far as that goes so there's that um okay so next up and i don't i don't think we're going to have time to go through the entire book maybe this will be a series uh, but we did we did get uh, them done and so it turned out really really good monica kudos good job girl give you a little shout out in the comments uh, okay, so under chair pose, what we have in this book, if you have your yoga anatomy book with Kamenoff and Matthews, get it. And if you are looking for their program, the one I took, I took fundamentals and I took principles with them. They're both amazing. So I have, I don't know, maybe a hundred hours in training directly with them, and their group and their team. They, they're really, they're really do a nice job. Um, if you haven't had a chance to take that, I will be running anatomy clinics at edge and online and in person and hybrid. So connect with me if you're interested in that. I partner with them so you can learn directly from them as I have and I have to say that that has gone such a long way in helping me just get the anatomy behind the asana and then understand the asana as a whole. So with that being said, no further ado, uh, we have our chair pose here and pretty much, I mean, everything's fired. 
there's so much going on here. You know, here, if we, if we pull like the, the navel towards the spine, we might have a core engagement there. Um, if we're wrapping from side to center, really activating the strength as we sit a little deeper into those glutes, you know, that, that sort of thing. The erector spinae are the muscles that run alongside the spine and hold the body upright so we can stand and walk and such. Um, and really everything's being used here, the arms here. So, so here's a nice example of uh, modifications we might offer to give our people. So if choosing between do we want the arms up or do we want to sit a little bit lower, I would say yes and yes, but maybe switch it up. Maybe this week, the um, cue that you give them is to sit and then the quality being as deeply as it feels right for you, right? Keeping in mind the comfort of the knees that's going on. Um, or maybe next week your focus is, okay, last week we played around with sitting a little bit more deeply. Let's do that again this week. Only this time, instead of our arms overhead, let's bring our hands to heart center instead. And by doing that though, you've changed up the entire muscle usage going from about the shoulder girdle up. And so that's okay because it, it might allow the practitioner to zero in on the lower body and the lower leg complex, which is like the knees down, which is commonly underdeveloped and one of the biggest reasons for falling. So when we think about um, different demogra demographics that are, are newly interested in yoga and in vast amounts of population, we have this active aging population that wanna stay active. You know, I mean, we're living longer, we want to move longer, we want to keep our independence and stability longer. And so part of that is not living a sedentary lifestyle, but doing postures like chairs. So at Edge here, we have the bar, which I really recommend. And you could switch that up for like a countertop. Most kitchens have countertops. Uh, I don't really recommend like an actual chair because most chairs, no matter how sturdy, you know, might give and a, an unsturdy chair might be worse than no chair at all. So I personally tend to go for a kitchen countertop. If you guys are teaching this like via Zoom or something like that, virtual classes, you're going to want to bring them to a place with, um, with a setting that is is it moving on them, right? Okay, so let's get back to it. So with our chair, if we were to imagine that Monica had placed her hand on the bar, which is a whole nother photo shoot, a whole nother, another lesson, another course. If she had done that, then she still would have kept everything activated from um, the soles of her feet all the way up through her wrists, uh, but not on the hand that came down, right? So then the muscle usage would be different on the left side than the right side. So shout out to Yoga Dan and my good Pete's over at 1103 Connection. They're rocking and rolling it over and running their in-person yoga teacher training in Southern Illinois right now, loving it. And so um, Yoga Dan would often say left side first because what we see commonly happen in yoga is the right side gets a better workout than say the left side. And the reason for that is that a, a yoga teacher might might meticulously put a student through uh, or into a posture in a mindful kind of way on the right side, keep them there longer, maybe work them a little harder, and then also the left side, you know, that kind of thing. So from time to time, if you were to switch it up left side first instead of the right, I think that that has merit. Uh, doing the right side first comes with some advantages in that you already know what side you did because you always do the right side first. And there are deeper, um, deeper reasons for why the right side is first and they fall in line with some of the history of yoga uh, but with that being said this lesson is about the anatomy of the body and so because of that I would recommend switching it up sometimes right side first sometimes left uh, so that's just one fun thing to consider uh, okay the next one we did was a standing forward bend okay Uttanasana and typically in Sanskrit that a is silent uh, but I can't quite do it. Utanas. I just want to say the A. And so with that, that's okay. You know, celebrate your language skills as your as they come to you. But just fun fact, Sanskrit, that A is is silent. And so I may have said it before at some point, but it's not yoga, it's yog. So that would be like, hey, do you want to come to yoga class with me? Nobody would know what you're talking about. So I think that um, that's okay. You know, language is an agreement amongst the people and as long as you're sharing the idea, you know, I hold space in on that. And for, for the purists out there, 
I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not your jam, and that's cool too. Anyway, so let's get back to it. Uttanasana, standing forward fold. Uh, so here, what we do is we stretch the west. This is the back side of the body. And so we have all the way up from the starting with the, the bottom of the toes through the soles of the feet, rounding through the heels, up through the Achilles tendons, beyond the calves. Uh, if there's a bend in the knee, there's less impact on the knees there. There's less muscular action in the knees if it's bent, if not a little more. A lengthening of the hamstrings, which one example of why yoga is just so stinking good for runners because runners commonly have nice, strong, although shortened hamstrings, and we are looking to lengthen them. And then coming all the way up through the backside and the spinal extensors, we talked about that a little bit. And, you know, honestly, if you come in, you, you tuck your chin, this muscle action will continue up through your neck, through the top of your head, along the front of your face, all the way coming in, right? And then maybe even in throat chakra, perhaps, if you, if you manage to get that far. You know, and for some people, this posture feels very good. But for the purpose of the photo shoot, we changed it up uh, so that you could have a few different variations. So if you wanted to work a little more deeply into this and find the bind in this, you're playing around with your bind, then based on what I've said, I would recommend that you take a micro bend or even a generous bend in the knees so that you can play around with that bind. And then maybe slowly over time, as we have a lengthening of the hamstrings, then we might have a, a straightening of the legs and still accomplishing the bind. But you know, it's like anything, it, it, it's like art, it doesn't happen. Overnight, it happens with consistency and repetition. And so I hope that uh, that that's an invitation for you to play around with your, your posture. Uh, another one that I often recommend when yoga teachers are bringing people into a forward fold is that they come into it with a slight knee bend, like actually cue this posture here. So we're gonna come into a generous knee bend, invite the belly to the thighs, take some breathing, flowery language, insert here and then reach the hands to the opposite elbows. And here we might even have a nice stable hold or we might have a little bit of a sway. Uh, typically at this point, I'm not even really cueing the feet just yet, whether they're together or apart. I'm just allowing people to feel their way through it and see what their bodies want to do. And I think it's it's nice. Um, for one, there's, there's certain, I mentioned earlier active aging which you know, each month I kind of highlight another demographic and I zoom into that a little bit more and I try and use that, that demographic as the example. And so while yoga is really good for helping to prevent osteoporosis, uh, if, if osteoporosis is already present, then we want to be extremely mindful of bringing our active agers into a forward fold, uh, you know, a, a weight bearing loaded, posture such as this, because we could have little tiny fractures in the lumbar spine, and that would obviously not be ideal. And so some, some key things that we can do, and I'll show you a posture that works for you, but would be not to come all the way down, to bend the knees, to use blocks, or if she had been facing the bar, she could have her, her fingertips outstretched on the bar, and then uh, her body shaped in an L. And by doing so, finding still that nice lengthening stretch without involving the inversion or the potential for the uh, the tiny fractures, yeah, osteoporosis. So just some key things, and we'll talk about some other contraindications that might show up in yoga. Just I'll just thread them in organically, and you'll pick them up as you go. And know that I do tend to repeat them, so it's okay if you don't memorize it all just right now today. That's okay too. So, uh, all right, so here, another progression. So here we're kind of playing around in the direction closer to where that bind would be. So this would be, again, a generous bend in the knees, but now we're bringing the, the, the hands to the earth. Why I love this is because you still get that earthy grounding connection of hands and feet to the earth. And I think there's much to be said for that. In a yoga class, I would recommend you spend a little time to allow the student to explore this one. This would be a good one to maybe invite in some pranayama, some, some breathing techniques. Um, no extreme breathing techniques because we're inverted. Um, but, you know, I think that it would be a nice place to maybe even take a centering breath, right? Or a call to action in, um, in finding gratitude for the day 
you know, or connection. You know, especially right now, we're, we're a little bit more isolated than perhaps we've been in the past. And a result of that is is being just to connect with the earth and know that, you know, we, we are one big living organism that is this planet earth and beyond. And there isn't any any real empty space between us. And for those of you that know, I'm like kind of a little bit of a science geek. If you haven't checked out um, some of the work that Fermilab has been doing on particles, uh, Google that or hit Twitter because that's how they're talking about on this day. Um, and it's really, really amazing as we begin to understand the unfolding of how energy works. And so know that we don't really know with certainty exactly how energy works. But what I can say is this, um, Einstein, whom I studied for a good long time, uh, I, his biography, A Life, excellent, excellent book, check that out. Um, but he goes into talking about, you know, the big things. So this isn't the small things, the quantum physics are the small things, but he's talking about the big things. So like space time, the fabric space, things like that. The problem is Einstein's work doesn't match the map itself doesn't match up with quantum physics which is the small things the tiny particles the things we can't see so because this map doesn't match there's some sort of hiccup some sort of disconnect and einstein had said you know as, as his time on earth was expiring he had said someone else is going to have to finish this work so he said that he said this is how far i was able to get it perhaps somebody else can pick it up and carry it on and so the recent um, happenings at Fermi Lab uh, in, in regards to the the way the particles wobble. There's the term of the week, wobble. So if you're if you're if you're seeing things like particles are wobbling, this is the idea behind that. And they're starting to understand this. And this is the point why it has something to do with yoga and Uttanasana, in that they're seeing that the particles aren't behaving the way they thought they did which is exciting news, right? Just because we always thought that there was a truth in the past, it doesn't mean that that is the same truth in the present. And that's okay, that's, that's okay. You know, that's to be celebrated. So that's an area of both, right? It's not, oh, this person was wrong. I would say that that, that level of thinking might be a little closer to ego and not really my jam. So an exploration of how far we're getting and how we start to, connect the big picture because ultimately we can only have the big things when we understand and culminate the small things that make them up. And, you know, the same thing goes for yogis. So if, if we consider ourselves little particles, tiny little quantum physics particles in the grand scheme of things of space time, right, which is just huge, the fabric of space and so on, um, you know, we're, we're, we're little little bits and that can be humbling of course especially if we live in our way where it's like there's me and my show you know for a long time I did do that I had like the Michelle show going you know and 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 I'd like to think that perhaps I've evolved uh, beyond that I'm not saying say I don't ever work back to that but it just happened you know so with that being said when we take postures like this if we understand even the smallest fragment of science when we take postures such as the palms come to the earth and we make that connection between the hands and the feet that it doesn't just end there. You're not alone. You're part of a community. You're part of a sangha. You're part of a tribe. You're, so, you're part of something bigger than yourself. And if as a teacher, without going into maybe a science lesson, like the one that I just gave you, but maybe just little specks and glimmers of it to, to just remind your, your students, hey, you're, you're, you're not alone. You know, you're not alone. This is, we're in this together. And I feel that that feels good. So in this way, I really love this series so much. So let's play around with it a little bit more. Um, <clears throat> As we move to the hand toe pose or standing big toe, toe pose hold or whatever it is your lineage calls it. I will speak briefly on lineage just because this is kind of part one of our series going through this. But um, okay, so in the beginning, right, we had the modern day father of yoga and that cat's name, Krishnamacharya here. And in his early days, when he was a young man, he had the opportunity to train Patavi Joyce. And he did that 
um, when Patabi Joyce was a, a young spry man and young man, and many of Krishnamacharya students were young men uh, that had short attention spans and perhaps needed a little bit more of uh, a stern directive on how to go about getting in these postures and kind of a, a more the approach was a little more along the lines of a make it so like here's the posture do it and this is how to do it and and there was also at that time an influence um, perhaps it's, you know, of course I wasn't there on that day, but it's been suggested an influence from um, British gymnastics coming in. And so we might, we, we might see the commonality between some gymnastics movements and yoga asana, and that it's possible that that's the connection there. You know, I wasn't there to say for, for sure, but that's certainly how I feel about it. And so cut to a little bit later into his career and Krishnamacharya then goes on to train, um, oh, um, and Patabi Joyce, um, Ashtanga yoga, very similar to what you might see, similar, similar, similar to what you might see in a hot yoga and that this is the poet's work towards it, right? It's just a mindset. So later in his career, Krishnamacharya then comes across Iyengar and, and, takes him under his wings and teaches him. Well, Iyengar shows up with some medical, um, uh, let's see, what's the nice word, obstacles, so these obstacles. And so he would be the one to really, really uh, coin the, the common use of the props. But he did it in an effort to use the props so he could get into the end pose, the one that I had alluded to moments ago with my time choice. And so if, if you think about it on this level, that if you use a block to bring the floor to you to make your limbs longer, right, then you may be able to get to this end result thing. So still a little bit more of a mindset with Iyengar on how to get into it, but how to get into it um, in quite a clever way of, of using these props. And this is not unlike Pilates and that Joseph Pilates used props to help injured soldiers rehab and that would be um, the foundation of Pilates. Another love of mine in, in tandem with, with yoga, both great. Different though, Pilates is more healthy core, healthy body, and yoga is more breath centered, but I digress. So going back to Iyengar, um, if, you, if you are familiar with Yoga Journal, it would be uh, Yoga Journal. It was Iyengar started, students that started that. Uh, although I would say present day, they really do, they cover a number of different lineages in, in yoga journal. So stay with me and we'll get to the point on this posture here. A little further down to his career, towards the end of his career, Krishnamacharya is, uh, you know, his, his flavor of what yoga means to him is, is taking a shift and he's beginning to dabble in the Ayurvedic studies and it really it captures his heart and his attention. And his son then, as, as he's got a little older, uh, Jessica Char, wants to learn yoga from his father. And, you know, his father had some pretty crafty tricks like the heart stopping trick and things like that he was known for. And Jessica Char wants to learn them. It's like all little bit older sons want to do like, oh my gosh, teach me that. And, you know, Krishma Char would do it. And the, the idea behind that is by then, Krishmacharya had seen that I don't know that I need to go to such extreme movements to get the benefits of what it is we're trying to do. And I, I mentioned that in class that do the benefits outweigh the risks. And I think that that's a, a really important idea that we want to hold close to our heart. And so going back to Jessica Char and Krishmacharya, father, son, late in his life, Jessica Char, he himself too begins to learn and dabble in Ayurveda, which is just, you know, why you see on my, on my, on my media, on my walls, on my blogs, why you see not only postures and, and things like this, but you also see foodstuffs. Um, you see things about the different um, ways of living, temperaments of people, things like that. It all, it all kind of funnels back to the Ayurveda, which, which I'll probably spend the rest of my life studying and by no means claim to be an Ayurvedic expert, but I'm really bridging into it and I absolutely love it. And so with that being said, and why I'm spending so much time on this one is Jessica Char, Krishnamacharya, son Jessica Char, trained Leslie Kamenoff, author of this book. 
And so if you think about what lineage is my truth for my yoga practice or what studio do I want to go to or where do I want to practice? I think the first thing you would want to ask yourself is what lineage might be right for me? Like what sets my soul on fire? And there's absolutely no right or wrong in any of this. Um, you know, much of, of the lineage that I have explored through Leslie Kamenoff and Desk Char, it, it, it is also later in my career. You know, I mean, I've been training for like over a decade. I might be moving on 15 years. I don't know, I lost count. A while. I've been training a while. And I can tell you when I started, it was very athletic. It was Pilates based. Um, there's still a hint of Pilates, uh, uh, you know, at the foundation of what I believe yoga and the body can do. Um, but it was certainly more power yoga. My first company name was Salutations Yoga. I had this beautiful pink and black flowery logo that was super exclusive and really only invited women to come in this beautiful font that no one could really read. And I had so many people not know how to spell salutations to type in my web address. So eventually we, we ended up with Ed Yoga School, which is where we are now, which is one sister company of the umbrella of companies that I have in that would be Power Edge. And this is where then we have these different services. So because of that, because of that, I would then soon find that I too love this, this, these Ayurvedic teachings. I love the whole body experience. I love how I feel when I eat well versus when I don't eat well. I love how I feel when I sleep versus when I don't. I love how I feel when I close the laptop and I take a break and I bring no referral off my little, my little fur bag, you know, and understanding where in your routine you could infuse just little things to help you have a more joyous experience, Asana also plays that role. And so that might mean if you're just having a hard time gaining some movement or momentum in the day, an Asana practice and bringing us back to this particular posture here, an Asana practice can really go a long way in getting getting one up and going. It's going to impact all of the systems. And you know, in our course, we go through how the how the asana impact each individual a system. Uh, but for me, what I find is if I can just pull out my yoga mat, if even not a yoga mat, I will take the carpet and just do maybe even just like a tabletop cat cow child's pose, you know, maybe play around a little bit, allowing the shoulders to drop down, flow a little bit, kind of like you would see in moon salutations with Shiva Ray, for example. You know, th those are kind of, if you haven't checked that out, do so, I'll drop it in the link, I think about it. Um, but as, as we're feeling maybe not strong in our lives, like sometimes that happens, we feel not strong in our lives, it goes a long way to do a strengthening badass pose like this one here. I think that it can be an empowering experience. And along with it, quite a bit of muscle usage. We have muscle usage, you know, largely in the lower uh, leg complex, but understand that when we think about the abs that are being used, they're starting at the sternum. So if, if you make your way down your breastbone to your sternum there before we hit fleshy area, you know, that's going to be start of the engagement of the core use that we have and lengthening as well. And so it'll be this interplay between this contraction of the muscle and this lengthening. And it's that pranayama piece, that breath piece, when we introduce it, that helps us unpack that. So as we, you know, inhale to explore a posture and exhale to execute it, or maybe switch it up next time in a different way, you know, it holds space for, um, for lengthening the muscle and then contracting the back and vice versa. And that's what strengthens muscles. And that's why yogis tend to have such nice definition for primarily on their secondary muscles. And so there's primary muscles like biceps, strong, you know, and then there's these secondary supportive role muscles. And if I could liken that idea to something tangible that you could just remember for all time, kind of like this book, you know, we have, we have, we have Leslie Kavanaugh and, you know, this, these are his teachings and he's kind of the main guy, um, but Amy Matthews' role of coming in and unpacking and describing in a granular way versus this broad strokes way, which is more of what I subscribe to, I, I think helps the student understand it, the posture and the impact of the posture in a much deeper way than otherwise. And so 
This is a really beautiful one. And Monica did a lovely, lovely job of this. If this one isn't in your practice as much, use the bar and maybe even perhaps a strap. Um, I do recommend just like the chair, you're going to want a sturdy strap. I like the ones that are the D rings, D rings, they look like two Ds, they're rings. Um, they're a little bit more secure than some of the, the plastic clips that could unclip on you and result in a fall. So fun facts um, that I picked up along the way. And again, just like anything, we get to where we go. So you might, you might even have that strap under your thigh. You might have one hand on the bar and the other hand holding the thigh, you know, that that would actually lead into something big like a birds of paradise, which I personally, you know, is not my jam as much, but it might be for yours. And that's how we get there. You know, we get there through understanding the muscle actions and, and some of these fundamental foundational movements. And then we just keep building on them. And that's what brings us to another place. So with no further ado, uh, let's move on to everybody's favorite tree pose. Yay for tree pose. Um, okay. So so much going on with tree pose front and back, uh, primarily depending on what's going on with the hands. Here she has them in heart center. So we have less engagement from the shoulder. We have less engagement in the shoulder girdle, the arms, the, the forearms or anything like that, which would make sense because the hands are a little bit more in a passive role. And so what we do have is much engagement going through the diaphragm, through, through the muscles within the, um, the rib cage, just under the sternum as we talk begins our, our core then and that wraps down and, and Leslie Kamenoff has a really great anatomy um, clinic actually you can you can go I, I don't know where it is but periodically you can go and attend you know his live his live anatomy clinics but it's it's not my thing as much I like this um so anyway so the muscles then of the core come all the way down they make their way through the side body which is which is your uh, obliques, so not the front of your belly, not your sick pack, but on the side, your obliques, and they wrap, and they, they cross thread like a, like a fabric, and when this happens, then we want to make sure that we do so in a balanced way, so because we have this fabric, we don't want one side to be a little tighter and the other to be a little looser, one side to be more contracted and the other to be more lengthened. What we're really looking for is balance, and so our balanced postures first and foremost, really start with a balance within the core. And then from there, once our core muscles are fired up and engaged, which is why you would want to do some like um, asana that fire up the core and prepare the core before we begin the, the balance series in a class or apex pose, we talked about that in training, but it, it then moves its way through the hips with hip flexors, you know, coming down through the legs all the way down through the lower leg complex and so on. Um, so really kind of considering all, all that has this going on. Um, for this one, the one muscle that I'll point out because I can't teach you all of it, uh, you know, on, a, on, a, on this little clip, but um, as you see that her, her leg, that uh, her foot is to the inner thigh. It's above the knee or it's below the knee. It's above the knee or it's below the knee. It's not on the knee. It's never on the knee. No matter what, it's above it or it's below it. It might be on the ankle, perhaps even on the ball of the foot on the floor. Still okay, not on the knee. So here she has her foot on her inner thigh and her gracilis muscles, the inner thigh of that leg are firing and working. And why this is so important is so many people just in our daily life, because we don't move on this plane that much, you know, at least here in the West, um, if we do a lot of sitting in chairs or maybe even walking, walking the dog, something like that. But what we commonly see is underdeveloped inner thigh muscles, gracilis muscles. And the byproduct of that would be an imbalance of the muscles that wrap around the leg. So if you think of the leg as like a trunk of a tree, for example, we've got the muscles spun around the leg, you know, we're gonna want like a balance between the muscles, between the front, the back, the outer, outer sides and the inner sides. We're gonna want balance there. And then when we have that, we have a lot less of that tugging, pulling on the low back that otherwise is seen in most folks with underdeveloped inner thigh muscles. So Suzanne Summers, thigh master, get it back out. You know, I have to say it, the inner thigh muscles are still where it's at. It needs to happen. Um, if we have low back things going on, if you, if you have, you, and, and this is not like staying in my scope of practice for sure. I'm not a physical therapist at all. It wouldn't have taken much more education for me to go that route. 
although I decided I wanted to work in wellness, not illness, so I didn't. However, I have been to plenty of physical therapy, and I can tell you this, clamshells. So if you haven't done a clamshell, it's you come onto your side body, and then, you know, maybe you prop your head however it is comfortable, and you bend your knees, and you bring your feet and, and ankles together, and you open and close your knees like a clam, you can imagine clam, hence clam shells. Yoga sauna are named too by things in, in nature, um, tree pose being an example of that. So when we do these clam shells, we're developing our gracilis, our inner thighs. And when we're doing that, we're, we're helping to promote and improve the overall health of the body. And when we do that, then it gives a little less workload on your lumbar spine, your low back. And so for folks that have things going on with their low back, if their doctor starts to see it commonly, you're sent to physical therapy. And once there, that's what they had you do. So while this is not to replace your medical team, listen to them um, on those things. But if you're still in a place of wellness, that's a really great, well, great, great, uh, blah, 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 great way to encourage overall uh, back health, right? Strengthen them. Let's move on, shall we? Okay, so another angle of our tree pose here, just to kind of remind you of what's going on the backside. So definitely firing up the glutes, uh, the back of the legs, and you know, not as much on the upper body until the arms rise. And so I remember I had a, uh, I worked at a studio and she taught Zumba there. She did a really great job. And the students wouldn't want to put their arms up in Zumba and she would really encourage them to do so um, because you burn more calories with your arms up than down. And so the fundamental theory behind movement and burning calories and weight loss, if that's what you're trying to do, is move your limbs away from your midline. And so move your limbs away from your body or from your midline, your spine, your center. And that, that will then require more work for your, um, for your body. And it will, it, it will result in larger and healthier muscles. And it's the muscles that are the caboose of the metabolism that is your training. So that's why when they say, uh, if you wanna lose weight, strength training is where it's at, and that's true. So that might be weightlifting, that might be physical weights. Um, you know, you won't really find me doing a deadlift, but you might, um, or the weight of your own body, which yoga also does. And so as we get off the floor, we get up, we stand up, we start to have an increase in, in the size of our muscles, our muscle fibers get bigger and longer and healthier and more efficient and effective, that drives our metabolism. So if you're teaching yoga for weight loss, if that's your class on Tuesday night at 6.30, yoga for weight loss, if that's what you're teaching, then you you might really maybe maybe offer up, take hands to prayer and then slowly float the hands you know, up and allow your tree branches, you know, maybe even to sway, play a little bit, you can do that as well. Uh, but makes all the difference in the world as far as that goes. So really what you're doing is you're shifting your cues, you're shifting your qualities, your qualities are how to do it. Your cues are what you do, your qualities are how to do it, and your modifications are what else can you do. And it, at Edge, I put quite a bit of emphasis on learning a sister posture for, um, for any given posture that you could call out for folks that maybe if this isn't gonna work for, there's something else that they can do. And we get into that, you know, on another lesson, but um, I hope that helps develop your understanding a little bit of those things. Um, okay, so let's moving on to Eagle Pose. So, so much going on here. What we really have in Eagle Pose is, um, I would define as close to a posture is, is some of the benefits you might see in yin yoga. So let's talk about yin yoga. Uh, traditional yin, conventional yin, which isn't as much as what I personally subscribe to. I do more of a hybrid, so there's my disclaimer. But traditional yin, the idea is to move your body out of anatomical alignment, which this whole lesson has been surrounded about staying in anatomical alignment, right? So in yin, we move out of anatomical alignment for the purpose of stretching the connective tissues further, because the connective tissues are kind of like Laffy Taffy. Remember Laffy Taffy, that candy from back in the day? So if you drop a Laffy Taffy on the sidewalk, which some of us may have done, 
and then step in it with your shoe or even worse yet barefoot, you know, it's going to be pliable. It's going to stretch with you. You know, it might, it might even stretch out three, four feet versus that Laffy Taffy you throw it in the freezer or maybe you liked that. Uh, I never did. Um, but you throw it in the freezer, you like that. And then you pull that same Laffy Taffy out and you go to pull it. Not only will it not pull, it just simply will not pull, but a little bit, a little bit of lo load or pressure and it'll snap or break. So hence, you know, muscle tears, things like that. That's when that starts to go on. That's what that, that's what you, why runners, runners commonly see this. And this would be the why behind that. So understanding that if we do postures such as this, kind of circling back, if we do postures such as this, it gives us an opportunity to move our muscles and our connective tissue and our skeletal system out of the anatomical alignment and just stretch into a bigger place. And if held for a time, so not five seconds, this isn't a vinyasa flow posture. This, this would be yin yoga or yin hybrid yoga or hatha yoga. Um, we'll talk about the true meaning of Hatha yoga itself on another day. But for this purpose, if on the schedule it says Hatha yoga, this would be a good posture for you to teach. Uh, I do really like it. There's so many different ways you can go about doing it. Usually when I, when I teach this, I start out with, let's invite the toe to the ground. So both feet are on the ground. And I do the arms first because just getting the arms sorted out, people can be in and, 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 and I, I do like to invite a little bit of a playful space here. Let, let's get all tangled up and have some laughs and really like not, not take ourselves so seriously in this thing. Like, can we do that? And then finding, finding the arms tangle up a little bit, you know, ultimately, I guess the end result would be either the palms together or the back of the hands together, depending on, on where you are with this. You know, some people will even do that in the float it up overhead, which by the way, is one of the best chair yoga postures I can offer you. Do it slowly, mindfully, and when you're warm, but if you're sitting at the chair all day and you're kind of feeling like those knots around the neck, you know, that, that, ah, right. You're feeling that this is what you do. Even if you're sitting, this is what you do. Check with your medical team prior to taking any advice that I might be using today. So with that being said, Okay, so once the arms are all sorted out and we have a lengthening of the connective tissue outside of where we would normally be found, so many of the muscles are being impacted by this all the way through the, the, the whole backside. I, I don't want to get into Latin on, on this one. Um, all the way through the backside, opening it up, really, really nice stretch, muscle engagement, but more of a release. It's a nice time to close your eyes. And your eyes want to close in this posture more often than not. Uh, well, mine, it, mine do, I don't know about yours, but mine do. Anyway, so moving on. So, okay, so once we have the upper body sorted out and we're beginning to take the seat, maybe then if before our toe was on, on the ground, maybe now we invited to tuck up and wrap around just, just around the ankle here, like I had Monica do, right? Maybe you bring it up higher than that and you crunch the body in. I've seen some yogis um, come into this where, you know, that wrapped leg is much higher and the um, fingertips are raised as I demonstrated a moment ago. And the whole thing is very quite tight. And then they even perform like a little C-shaped crunch on top of it, you know, and that's great. If that's where you are, fantastic. You know, that shows that you put in a tremendous amount of time and dedication to bring your practice to that place. And there's something to be said for that. The actual workflow of getting to a posture like that is certainly honorable. But at the same time, it's not the end all be all. And it's not why I do yoga. It's definitely not why I teach yoga. Um, so, okay, so let's move on. Uh, coming into dancer's pose. Okay, so I want to show you the front of this book, just because it's copyrighted, I'm going to show you pictures inside the book. Go, buy the book, buy their book, get it. Um, but here, we're not far off. Here, we're standing, there we're kneeling. And so one thing that I like to teach my practitioners in training is that you can come with, up with a sequence, but have, have this one be standing and that one be kneeling and this one be seating. But can you keep the postures? Can you keep the essence of, of the primary movers of the muscles that we've been talking about? Can you keep consistency there, but then just change where you are in relation to the earth? So when we can take away the component of perhaps falling and bring it down to the ground, we might be able to explore postures uh, a little bit more deeply. We might be able to develop some of the muscles um, uh, to become stronger, to, 
to effectively execute that posture while standing. We may help prepare the connective tissue um, in order to allow for the healthy muscles to get to where they want to go because the healthiest, strongest muscles can only go as far as the connective tissue that they're wrapped in around and surrounded by are, are able to go. So those are some things that you're going to want to keep in mind. Um, with, with this particular one, we see this king of dancers pose, um, versus on, on the front of the book, king pigeon. There's so many, if you, if you Google pigeon, so that'll be like your call to action, Google pigeon. And I just want you to see how many different results there are on king or on pigeon. There's king pigeon. There's, I mean, there's so many different ways to do this all to be celebrated. And typically what happens is remember before <clears throat> when I mentioned that there's about 80,000 documented yoga poses, you just change the name of the pose you're in, but you're still in a pose. It's probably helping you as long as you still have that muscular alignment. So that's my, that's my emphasis at my school is maintain a muscular alignment when you choose to do any given posture. So in this one here for Monica, this is how far she's able to effectively go and still reach her foot. Any further than that, and all of a sudden the hips start to open kind of like that warrior one hips forward versus warrior two hips to the side. Same idea here. And uh, another great use for this one would be with a strap. Uh, so straps are nice here. All those straps while standing in the middle of the room, I think is kind of an accident. So we want to consider that. As far as muscle usage goes, I mean, pretty much just darn near everything's fired up on this one. A lot is going on. It could be made more accessible um, if, if perhaps she used the bar with one arm um, and it could be more advanced if she had both hands on the foot. Something that you won't as commonly see me offer in class because what I see is, is we, we lose our alignment for most students in class just in an effort to have the posture look a certain way. Now it feels a different way. So I'd rather the posture be a smaller posture um, and not far as a progression and feel the same way than look it. So, you know, that that's the essence of what it, what are we trying to accomplish in the posture? If we're, if we're coming at it from, from an anatomical lens, then, you know, it would stand to reason that that, that would be why we choose which, which versions we take. Um, okay, Warrior One, good old Warrior One. Who doesn't love it? Who doesn't know it? A couple of things about Warrior One. Um, the name is sourced from the name of a fierce mythical warrior. Fierce, mythical warrior. And so the story goes in or around, you know, Michelle Way is the village back in the day, the village was being uh, terrorized by this monster. And a warrior came in, slain the monster's head, held the monster head overhead, as you see demonstrated in this warrior one, notice those shoulders come back and down, right? Right, holding this heavy, this heavy monster head. It's heavy. So we're going to have engagement in through the arm when we're holding this monster head to show the village that they are now safe and will no longer be terrorized by a monster. So whether or not that did or didn't happen, I can't be sure because I wasn't there. Although in this book, they do suggest mythical warrior. So point is then, where do we want the arms to go? Well, I guess the width of the monster's head. How big is that? I don't know, however big your monster is. What I want it to be is, is wherever it feels good within the shoulder girdle. So for some folks, if they've had shoulder um, surgeries, rotator cuff injuries, anything going like that, you know, it might be better to have the hands a little further apart, a wider stance, you know, than up so tight. Um, also, what's going on with, with the neck? So like in here we do, uh, we do lion's breath, we stretch out, stretch out the tongue and it really, it stretches out all of this. And so when we do things like that, it complements things like this and impacts where your students are gonna feel comfortable putting their hands. If they're newer to yoga, or if they're returning to yoga from an injury, sometimes it might be better to bring hands to heart center while we situate the lower leg complex and then by extension, the, the lower body and the legs themselves and the pelvis and the core, and then decide what to do with the arms. Add the arms in. 
And so with that being said, a couple things about the Warriors, uh, and, and I'll move on to the next one to do it. As we open up the arms here, now the pelvis opens up to the side. And so commonly at, at edge, this is an invitation. It's not a quick movement. We don't quickly zip in from warrior one to warrior two because we're moving the pelvis from forward to the side. And I like it because it invites the practitioners a chance to explore the pose, to kind of break out of it a little bit, to take away from the feet being apart, maybe just like walk it out and then come into this warrior two separate and independent of warrior one. It is at the expense of flow, but I think it helps practitioners understand that that back foot might go in a completely different place than it was a moment ago in warrior one. It might then mean that the foot is closer to the front foot or further from the, from the front foot. They might find that the back foot is at a 45 degree angle, which is commonly suggested, or that maybe it comes straight out in a 90 degree angle. So I guess I want to tie back in. Remember, we were talking about the different lineages that Krishnamacharya, one guy, taught the main guys. Most of these lineages, for the, for the most part, not always, ever, never, ever, but for the most part, these are the lineages we see in, in yoga studios. And the reason why we see the differences between them. Like, well, I went to a studio and I was taught that the foot was at 45 degree, eight degrees. And now I hear you say that it's at 90 degrees and you know, which is right. Both, both are right. It just depends on which one, which lineages you're following. And also with your own physical bony structure with the physical, if we've got a tape measure, uh, not your flesh, but your bony structure, how wide are your hips? It's going to vary from one individual to the next that's to be celebrated. The other key thing that I'd be remiss in not pointing out is that in the beginning, yoga was for men. Women were not even allowed to practice yoga. So since women do tend to have wider hips, then that means in many of the old books that we see of things like Warrior One, Warrior Two, Sun Salutations, they're geared to the male body, not the female body. And so if you're doing sun salutations and, you know, of which we see warrior ones, we might find taking a wider stance between the feet, not so much the length, not the length of the stance, but the width of the stance, a wider stance is what then prompts a muscular alignment and the ability, as I sketch back, the ability to have this beautiful alignment as you see demonstrated here by the lowly on the cover. So coming back to our warrior two, same thing. We might find the foot wanted to go to a different spot. We might find um, our, it's longer on the mat. We might find it's wider or more narrow, you know, just kind of playing around with it. Like what happens so that we don't lose that nice clean line that you see from our heel and moving up through the body and coming all the way up through the front, uh, front fingertips. There's also, there's also um, traditionally, a suggestion to kind of lean forward into this warrior two, right? Some people lean so forward, you want to bring them back, but ultimately get them in warrior two and then invite them to, to move into it forward just a smidge. And you'll see a change. You'll see a change in a, in a break of the line where we were sweeping and then all of a sudden it's straight. You'll see a change where it's a little bit more of a, a curvature, and nice clean flow. Like you see Monica here demonstrating. She, she's a lovely yoga and she, uh, yoga and she, she practices very regularly in order to, to get this practice that she has. Uh, so, okay, so let's play around with uh, Warrior Three. So this is fun. Um, commonly at Edge, I have the mats coming out from the bar and we will get back to that. I promise we will we'll get back to that on some level, probably not full on group, probably won't go in that direction, but maybe like small groups or private sessions, something like that. Anyway, so what I commonly do is bring warrior three to face the bar and then the fingertips can rest on the bar or hover just above it and know that they're there. What I do want you to pay attention to is that the foot is flexed. And when we flex the foot, we have so much more engagement through the core when we do that than when we don't. Um, the foot could be pointed, that would work too. Although I feel that flexing the foot for me helps engage my core. If you find pointing the toe works better for you, by all means, feel free to take that. But the point would be not to just forget about the foot is hanging out back there, but rather it be an active inclusion is part of the overall scene of what we've got here. Um, we could then even invite, uh, it would be a progression, you know, the hands to heart center. Um, some people like to open up into half moon in this posture. Um, 
I do. I like that. I guess it, that's just the way I've been doing it forever. Uh, the synovial fluids in the hips will largely um, uh, suggest whether or not you have the lubrication in your in your hip jo joints to do that. Others don't like to come into it that way because again, just like going from the warrior one to the warrior two, we're going from the hips facing down to the hips facing to the side. Same idea, right? So you might find getting into a half moon, although it seems clever enough to do from this posture, might more readily be obtained through something like a triangle or a side angle pose. So those are just a couple of things that we can explore. So let's talk about it. So here, here's our side angle pose right here. And again, we have that nice clean line that we saw coming from the, the edge of the foot. And so there's, there's a cue you hear in yoga class, you know, that edge of the foot, it, it's a powerful thing, right? And then even a little stretch, we think about the connective tissue and through the side of the foot, which can go a long way in helping from like rolling ankles, spraining ankles, things like that, you know, build up those muscles. And then coming up through the side body, it's quite intentional. There's a nice clean line all the way up to the wrist. Um, and then what you choose to do with your hand, if you want to activate it a little further and get a little bit more of a wrist stretch in through the forearms, uh, it could be nice for like, you know, if you're uh, typing and things like that, or you could just keep uh, the hand straight, I shouldn't say just, or you could keep the hand straight and have you have an uninterrupted line as well, like whatever works for you. What matters to me and what I care about is that this form that's placed on the thigh, we're not dumping our weight in order to be in this posture. If that is happening, we want to make a less lengthened stance, a more narrow stance this way on the mat, the mat being this way, shorter. Um, and then, you know, the core engagement to hold the body up is the idea. So we're not, we're not dumping the body weight on the forearm. Another thing I see in this posture commonly is that we have like a rounding of coming forward in an effort to reach down, reach down, go further because we want to take a longer stance on our mat. And so I would take, say, a shorter stance on the mat so that the knee isn't so quite far away. And then, um, and maybe even, maybe even if you're progressing into this and this is the posture that you're working in the direction of, then maybe even that top arm just like takes a place on the hip you know, and that, that's a game changer because what we really, really want is the chest open. So we want the chest open more than we want the arm up. So there's a, a priority of what we want to have happen with these things. So keeping that in mind, let's bring it to triangle. So if we were an extended side angle for a moment, you know, then, so, so we have quite a bit of stretch on the hamstrings and the quads in our ex extended side angle and up, of course, through the side body and so on. But if we then slide it right into the triangle, we have a little bit um, of a shift to the muscles, but more a distribution of the weight. The idea then is that we're holding our body up. And this is commonly where I'll see people so badly want to reach the floor, maybe because the yogi beside them is reaching the floor. Instead of that, um, grab a block, which is why I have blocks even for Monica's uh, demonstration here. Like put a block there and then bring the floor to you because all the yoga in the world is not going to change the length of your arms. And so if you consider it in that way that I'm not here to do triangle and reach the floor, I'm here to do triangle with an open chest, right? Different, different way to approach it. And so just kind of consider that. Um, in that extended angle, you could have kicked it back and taken a bite or you could have revolved it. Um, same thing with this one here, you could have revolved it. And then as you move forward into intense side stretch or pyramid pose, as Edge calls it, different, different folks call it different things depending on who they learn from. But in the end here, we do have a micro bend in the knee and Amy Matthews does in her book too. So if you're in the book following along, if you go get it, if you have it, um, it's a great book. Um, here, I think that this posture is so beautiful. These kind of postures are really beautiful for grounding. So if the world is just spinning around you and you want to just find stillness and ground and just pause for a moment, things like this can go a really long way and I highly recommend them. Um, as far as muscle actions, I mean, everything's pretty much fired up, not as much with the arms uh, because they're in a little bit more of a passive state, but in every other way, this is just such a nice way just to stretch out the, the whole body. Um, okay, and then if you wanted to bring the hands uh, back here, if you wanted to bring the hands um, into prayer behind you, you also could do that. And that's a progression of that. And a different lesson, I do have that shot though, keep an eye. 
Uh, all right, so why stands for hold? Uh, Michelle's favorite, Prazerita. This is so lovely. I remember when I was in my 300 hour yoga teacher training. Oh my God. I looked over and there's a student and she came in from here and just floated up like a butterfly into tripod headstand. And I was like, oh my gosh, wow. And the first thing I thought is how hard did she work to get that? I wonder how long she's been working on that. That's not something I do. Um, I do like, I like headstand, but I like to do it on my forearms. Um, I'm not as much wanting to put that much weight, load of weight on my cervical spine. Uh, but that's a, that's a beautiful way to get into it. Um, you could even do that if you came down on your forearms here, but really this one's so, so, so nice. If we're talking about that lengthening of the hamstrings there in the back of the legs and truly, to be honest with you, um, I think a, a really nice way for runners. So like if you're teaching yoga for runners, must have, must do. So you can invite folks to bend at the knees to work their way down, but then we don't have the lengthening in the hamstrings. So that might be more fitting for a um, grounding yoga in you class, for example, because again, the hands to the ground, as I suggested before, it is that piece a little bit more. Whereas if you're teaching yoga for runners, then it might behoove your student a little more to get um, the blocks and bring the forehead to the block, which is oh so nurturing. I mean, if you just think like a, a, a baby breastfeeding, you know, it's just, it's, it's a nurturing place on our body, like as humans. Um, so it feels really nice to bring the forehead to the block. And then it also brings the floor to you some, and it might allow you to invite your practitioners to straighten the legs versus to, um, have any time. So again, it's just your why. Like, what are you teaching and why are you teaching it? And who are you teaching it to? Or if this is your personal practice, why are you doing it? What do you want? What's your takeaway? What do you want to get from this? So those are some things. So um, good old fashioned squat. And I'm going to wrap this up with, with our squat, our series here, our standing series. Um, so good for you. I am, I'm currently taking this belly dancing course, which I'm just having such a blast doing. I'll actually, I'll drop that link in, in the comments first. It's just so great. Like it's so important to strengthen the pelvic floor. And this is something we don't talk about as much, but you know, one, if we have a nice strong balanced pelvic floor and core, then we might have less, um, less leaning, less uh, tendencies to maybe prefer one side in movement over another that oftentimes result in show up later is like orthopedic ailments. So one thing that we can do like on the preventative wellness side is strengthen our pelvic floor. Um, the other thing, our active agers, we talked about that. If, we're, if we have any kind of thing like with incontinence, anything like that, not that this is gonna solve it, but it can certainly help and it and will certainly can help prevent it by having a strong pelvic floor. So there's something to know about that. Um, in regard to like our prenatal course, um, Rachel does an amazing job in her, in her videos and demonstrations is very passionate about the importance of the pelvic floor, not only through the pregnancy in regards to maintaining a healthy pregnancy and maintaining pregnancy in itself for a nice, strong, healthy pelvic floor for an embryo to hang out, attached to and be at reside in for a time, but then also carrying on through labor. So, um, you know, those who do prenatal yoga, uh, find that they have, um, uh, easier time with labor commonly, not everybody all the time, ever, always, never naturally, but you get the idea. So those are some of the, some of the key things and takeaways that I got from this section of the book. I do really, really hope you, you enjoy this. Um, what we went over today, if you didn't have the book and you're like, shoot, I wish I had the book. I'd watch that again. I'm going to leave this video. I'm going to put it up on my YouTube channel for you. Um, it started, we started at mountain and, um, started, I'll tell you the chapter right here for you on chapter four standing poses so that's what we went over today so if you haven't already head over to my youtube channel and be a friend subscribe throw me a thumbs up maybe a comment that'd be good uh i do have a lot of visitors on my youtube channel but not that many comments and likes so you feel free to do that if it if it calls to you to do so uh it's always helpful to have the support of your community when you want to share your message with others so i do hope that this lesson has helped you all so much and i'm so excited to be able to bring this series to you and we will be back for more if you have any questions absolutely just you know drop them in the chat or you can hang out at our website go to edgeoverschools.com we have a chat there 
if you want to be added to our newsletter. I regularly send out things like this, and I highly recommend that you do. If you haven't already subscribed to Leslie Kamenoff's newsletter, do that straight away. If you love the granular teaching side, then hit up Amy Matthews one. She's, she also has one. It's very, very good. And, or both. And, and do both. So with that, love yourself, love your buddy, and find presence today. Namaste.